Welcome to The Lead, the New Lines Magazine podcast. I'm Faisal Yafai, and this is a podcast where we delve into the biggest ideas, events, and personalities from around the world. Few countries are more politicized than Lebanon. Within living memory, the country has endured civil war, assassinations of its prime minister and top officials, a nationwide anti-government protest movement, the 2020 Beirut port explosion that devastated the capital city, and most recently, the conflict in Gaza that has also claimed the lives of dozens of civilians on Lebanon's southern border. Lebanon's citizens, whether they choose to or not, live in the political firing line. In such conditions, almost everyone is forced to contend with the daily reality of politics. What it means and how it might affect you has real life, or even death, consequences. My guest today has also dedicated herself to living a political life, but she has only briefly dabbled in a career in mainstream politics. Jumana Haddad is a writer, journalist, activist, and one-time parliamentary candidate in Lebanon. In all these activities, she tackles political subjects head-on with a clear idea that she thinks we can all make the world a better place. Jumana features in a documentary scheduled to be released this year entitled Diaries from Lebanon that documents her journey from parliamentary candidate to activist. But she's also seen the ugly side of that commitment to a political life. She's faced campaigns to have her writing banned and had threats of violence made against her. Nevertheless, she said, we need to be involved in the world around us. Trying to make it just a little bit better by influencing just our direct circle is a duty, not just a choice. It's important for us to feel outrage whenever we see an injustice. Jumana Haddad, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Faisal. Let's start by following up on that quote of yours, you know, just across the border from where you are in Lebanon, over 30,000 people have been killed in Israel's war in Gaza. This border conflict in your own country between Israel and Hezbollah has been grinding away, leaving hundreds dead, including dozens of civilians. You mention outrage at injustice. You must be feeling a lot of outrage right now. A lot. And it's, you know, it's increasing day after day. You know, Faisal, uh, the last four years haven't been easy on us in Lebanon uh, from the, you know, the revolution that we had in 2019 and then the economic uh, uh, breakdown of the country and then the port explosion. And now what's happening in Gaza? I mean, I always uh, feel like things are getting worse instead of getting better. And this is what's making me even more outraged. Sometimes people ask me, when will you stop being angry? And I think I will die angry. Mm. Do you think you will you will die angry because the the situation in the region is unlikely to change in that time scale? At one point, I used to believe that it was going to change. Unfortunately, um, at least now, uh, at this stage of my life, I feel like it's a dead end situation, unfortunately. Uh, because um, uh, those the, the criminals are getting uh, stronger and meaner by the minute. And um, us, you know, the people, are getting more and more denied our basic rights, what makes us human beings, you know, we are denied that. So I don't think that uh, we are heading towards the end of the tunnel. We are stuck inside the tunnel and I don't see an end to this tunnel. I know it sounds quite pessimistic, but um, this is how it is from where I'm standing. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask you actually about the pessimism, because if you call it pessimism, because some people might call it realism. But I wonder if you feel that, is it difficult to kind of hold on to a political life at the very same time as you feel that things are actively uh, getting worse? Well, I guess it all depends uh, on what we mean by politics and how we look at politics. Is politics only, uh, you know, like running for parliament or having a position in the government, et cetera, et cetera? If Mm. that's politics for you, then no, I don't think that's where change is going to come. But politics for me is much more than that. It's even in the way we live our daily lives. You know, in your intro, you spoke about this small circle. 
any change that we manage to produce in this small circle of ours is a political act. Refusing to, um, you know, like, the way I and many others have done to just abandon this land, abandon this region. And I'm not blaming those who left. I understand them completely. But staying here, despite all the frustration, uh, all the fear, all the violence, all the despair, that's also a political act. Trying to change uh, the youth's um, uh, view on the values that make us good citizens. That's also a political act. And that's where I try to have uh, a small input uh, through my, my work and my activism. I notice that when you talk about the situation in Lebanon today, you're always very careful to say that you don't judge the people who have left. And I wonder if that's because there is such a a push for people to leave Lebanon because it is so you know difficult at various points and i wonder if that's a big part of the the internal lebanese conversation about whether to stay whether to go i mean it's always been like that ever since i was a child growing up during the civil war this push pull to stay or leave has always been there um and let me tell you that Everything pushes us to leave. Nothing encourages us to stay, but we stay nonetheless. And yes, it is a big conversation and it is a big suffering as well, because I know so many families um, have been dismantled, especially um, during the last uh, couple of years because of what's what's been happening in Lebanon. Uh, many of like, for example, I have a center called a Freedom Center for, for young people uh, to, you know, uh, uh, instill um, uh, values of freedom of expression and equality and secularism in them. And I can tell you that maybe more than 75% of our members have left the country. The young especially are leaving the country. It's, yeah. like, a, it's like we are bleeding our, our young. Yeah, yeah. And how do you feel about this, uh, this phrase? We had the, the Lebanese journalist Dalal Mawad on the podcast recently, and she told us that she, she really rejects this notion of Lebanese resilience. She was saying that um, convincing ourselves that we are resilient is actually counterproductive. I wonder how you feel about that, about this idea of the Lebanese, because Lebanese resilience is often uh, glorified in some way. I know, I know. It's like, um, I mean, I don't reject it because, because it's somehow true, but I resent it. And there's a difference between the two notions. Mm. Uh, um, it's, I mean... Sometimes people ask me, what's this Lebanese secret? Is it the fact that we've been trained through decades of hardship to quickly get back on our feet and recover after each blow? Uh, I'm convinced it's much more than that. It's not just resilience. It's like um, uh, a defiant stance, a big no in the face of everything that keeps trying to dishearten us, scare us, murder us, tell us that there's no uh, solution and that we are not worthy of living. So it's, we are resilient and it does have a positive uh, connotation, but it also like, just like Dalal said, has a negative impact on some of us because sometimes while we are trying to survive and seize the moment, because who knows what's going to happen tomorrow, we forget to live, we forget to fight. We forget that there's something more than just this minute or the minute after, that we need to build a real future, a deserving country, a country that respects us and that we respect. I think it's fair to say that uh, in your work and in your life, in a more general sense, you've dealt throughout with what we might call the the personal cost of politics. The personal cost of politics has been quite high for you, I think. Um, whether you're angry at the injustice of a political event that happened uh, generations past, which we will come to, or you're dealing with personal threats against you for your current political opinions. Uh, so before we talk about your political opinions and about this political moment in Lebanon, I thought I'd ask you about your personal experiences. Uh, we'll get to 
to the book you've recently uh, written or the novel. But I wanted to ask you if you think that, is there a line for you between the personal and the political? In my case, no, there's not. Actually, when you were asking me about the cost of, of uh, being in politics, mm. I, was, uh, I was thinking to say that it's actually the cost of being myself simply being myself. So this is, I mean, this is how I am, whether in my daily life or in my public life. And there's never been a separation between the two. And obviously it's quite hard to live like that. It's, uh, it's hectic even, it's exhausting, it's overwhelming. But just being who you are in a country and in a culture and in a region that always tries to uh, you know, uh, transform you into something else, into something that conforms to the main current, to the standards that are uh, there, to the religious views that are uh, 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 existing in this area. It's, it's also very political, just saying, this is how I am, this is how I think, this is what I want to say, this is how I want to live my life, and you don't have the right to tell me that I shouldn't be here. I should be here as much as you uh, have the right to be here. And that's that's also quite political, in my opinion. Do you find yourself sometimes thinking that you seem to be permanently at odds with per with parts of the Lebanese experience? I, I ask this because... You know, you and I have known each other now um, quite a few years, and I think in in many respects, for a certain generation of, uh, of of observers of Lebanon, Lebanese, we look at you and we think that you embody a certain type of Lebanon. But then sometimes when I talk to you, I wonder if you you do seem to have so much rebellion in you about where the state of Lebanon is. And I wonder if that is an internal thing or whether it's just, it's just, it's the outside world. It's everybody else. They're just permanently trying to change you from the person you are at your core. Well, maybe it's both. I mean, I've been, uh, I've always been a rebel and uh, it's, Sometimes I wonder, you know, I wonder, Faisal, if had I been born in a country, for example, like Sweden, where um, I shouldn't have to fight to be respected as a human being, where I shouldn't have to strive in order to get what is duly mine. Would I have been different? Would I have been this rebellious? No. I don't know. But I do believe that... Uh, just saying no to everything that tries to transform you into something you're not is an essential part of being alive. Sometimes you're just, you, you go with the flow. I've never been able to go with the flow. I've never been. And unfortunately, the flow isn't going in the direction where I want to go and the direction uh, where uh, I would like my life to go. So I just have to keep struggling and keep fighting. I feel like sometimes I feel like conflict is my flesh and blood. It's like yeah. such a huge part. It's been and it's and it still is such a huge part of my identity, of the way I view this world, that it's it's an intrinsic part of me. Now, would I love, am I tired? Would I love to live at least for a short period of time, a life of uh, serenity? Definitely. But am I able to do that after 50 years of, you know, fighting and struggling and refusing to submit? I doubt that. Do you think that you've never had opportunities for that? Because, I mean, it seems to me that there must have been periods of your life where you could have had uh, what you might think of as a slightly easier journey, even for a period of time. Do you not think perhaps you chose those moments? Yeah, it would have been like that. Uh, and yes, it, it would have uh, been possible if I had taken the choice of uh, or the decision to, like, for example, live abroad. And I right. could have done that and I still can do that. So this conflict that I'm talking about, it is also a choice, not just a destiny. I'm choosing this and I'm choosing this because somehow and call me naive or whatever, I'm convinced that even though 
I'm uh, um, fiercely criticized or fought or unaccepted. There are people in this part of uh, of the world who need people like me, and we are not a few. There are lots of us who are deciding to stay because change really does happen from within. It cannot be imported. And even if I went to live in France, because like I'm also French and I could go and live in Paris, for example, even if I lived there, would I be serene? No, because I would be completely immersed in what's happening here. And I would be unable to cut the umbilical cord with Lebanon. I mean, this is how I've always been. I leave, but I need to come back. This is where I belong. And this is where I demand my right to live and belong. I don't want to be pushed out. I refuse to be pushed out. You know, Lebanon is a a fascinating country in so many ways. One of the reasons it's so fascinating is that I think people are incredibly patriotic uh, towards it in the way that you find Palestinians are and and Egyptians are. And I, I find that one of the parts of it that I find so interesting is that the Lebanese also, in a way that a lot of other Arab countries don't, they kind of hold the idea of Lebanon with them, even when they go abroad or they go elsewhere. Uh, We were talking with one of our colleagues who is Palestinian about the necessity that the Palestinians have for carrying the idea of Palestine with them, even when they are uh, elsewhere. And I sometimes wonder if that experience is also a Lebanese experience, that somehow carrying with you the idea of Lebanon, the reality of Lebanon, the problems of Lebanon, um, is something that a kind of Lebanese feel they need to do. Well, let me tell you, patriotism is a, is a tricky notion, especially in Lebanon. Now, I understand maybe those who leave do carry the country with them, and that's when maybe they start being patriotic. But in Lebanon, it's not really patriotism. And I'm not quite sure if I like the notion or agree with the notion of patriotism anyway. It's more, uh, unfortunately, a sense of belonging to your religion or your sect. I wish we had more people saying, I am Lebanese, before saying, I am a Maronite, or I am a Shia, or I am a Sunni. Unfortunately, Uh, Despite uh, a very vicious civil war uh, from 1975 till 1990 and all the horrible events that came after that, all the assassinations, uh, all the bombings, etc., etc., people are still very... um, uh, attached or or defined by by their sect and this is not something uh, spontaneous or or uh, innate it's something that is instilled in them by the different political parties and leaders in order to be able to rule you know this saying in order to rule you need to divide we have it in arabic so People are divided by their uh, very, very um, uh, superficial difference, which is their uh, uh, their faith, in order to stay afraid of each other and not become um, uh, a people, basically. But I mean, you've interpreted my the term patriotic to mean a kind of loyalty to the state, which I, I mean, I understand that's normally what it does mean. But I kind of mean it in the sense of loyalty to an idea of being Lebanese, depending on what that conception is. Because one of the things that I think is so intriguing, like if you talk to, you're right, of course, there's, you know, the divisions between the various religions and the sects. But if you talk to Lebanese abroad and in Lebanon, they always say they are Lebanese. Something about the conception of them as Lebanese is more important than even the idea of what the current state looks like. Yeah. I mean, there is there is some kind of pride in, in being Lebanese, even though sometimes it borders uh, the cliches, you know, uh, being able to ski in the morning and then swim in the afternoon, uh, the nightlife, et cetera, et cetera. We are all that, but that's not uh, what we are. We are not just... 
the tabbouleh and uh, the good the good times and uh, uh, the uh, you know the ability to create joy from nothing we are also uh, people who are not managing to live with each other and we need to always remember that in order to heal because if we don't admit the problem we will never be able to move forward and this is a big problem we are we we always talk about you know the uh, miracle of um uh living together in lebanon despite all the differences and this is what's making us uh, um, unable to unite because we keep uh, stressing on all the differences that we have instead of stressing on what brings us together. And this is one of the reasons why the revolution uh, uh, on, on October 17, 2019 failed to bring a real change in the country, unfortunately. I suppose the next logical question is to ask what you think the Lebanese conception is. I knew there'd be a pause. Yeah, yeah. It's a hard question. Yeah, because, you know, before I answer that, I need to, because I think a lot about this. Am I, in, in, the, in the obvious sense, Lebanese? I mean, I do belong to other lands and countries and cultures as well in my heart as much as in my in my intellect so is my need to stay here uh the result of me feeling that i am lebanese or is it a mixture of what this place brings me uh as far as family and friends and memories are concerned as much as the fight that nourishes my need to make a change in this world and make it a better place. I mean, mm. I'm, I'm quite unsure whether I deserve between, uh, between uh, uh, brackets to, to, to call myself Lebanese or to say I am Lebanese first. I'd rather say I am a human being who lives in Lebanon, who loves this country, who was born here, who never left, who doesn't want to leave, and who uh, claims her right to stay even if everything or most of the things around her are pushing her to leave and to let go and to say that's it this part of the world is not mine anymore so is it is it obstination or uh belonging in the classical sense of belonging is it uh, a, a mutual uh beneficial partnership or is it a sense of belonging in the classical sense of belonging mm -hmm. i don't know I'm still discovering that in myself. I want to go back to the the point you made about somehow the 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 struggle being in the blood. Uh, you said that you are now the fourth generation woman in your family to experience a a different conflict. Um, but you've experienced conflict personally, perhaps throughout your living memory. And you were born in uh, in the seventies when just before the Lebanese civil war broke out. Yeah. How do you think that period of of your ta of your life, um, and of course the Lebanon War was there throughout your adolescence. How do you think that that period affected you? Oh, it definitely made me who I am. A big part of that. I mean, I always talk about two major um, elements uh, that have, or two major fires that have forged me. One of them is books and literature. They have, to a large extent, made me the person that I am today. And the second part is the fire of war and conflict and fear that I had to grow up with and deal with um, since a very young age. So it's it's war changes you. It's it's it doesn't necessarily makes you a, a tougher person or or a, a better person or a worse person, but it is um, a training on 
on the art of, of dying. I've always thought about death ever since I can remember. And it's not easy to live while thinking you can die any minute. And I think many Lebanese, this is how they live their lives. And I tried to fight that um, instinct in me because it, it became an instinct. It's not, it's a reflex. It's like, let me uh, do whatever I can do. I have this fear of missing out on whatever I can do today. And maybe this is why I've always been an overachiever. Uh, uh, it, because who knows if I'm going to be here tomorrow. And it's, it's, it makes you uh, a different kind of person. A fighter, yes, but also uh, someone who doesn't uh, know how to enjoy life properly. I'm not saying this out of sadness. I'm not complaining. I, I love uh, the way I've been molded, I know how at the same time sensitive and tender I am and how tough and strong I am. And I love that. And this is part of my journey uh, and what, what, what I've been through growing up in this country. But also, like I said earlier, sometimes I just feel exhausted, Faisal. Sometimes mm. I just want to wake up and not feel the need to go to war because this is how I wake up. And I know that many others are like me. We wake up and we say, okay, let's go to war because there, there's, maybe there's no big war, but there are so many small wars happening in our lives day after day, minute after minute. And we need to be for it and we need to be uh, you know uh, um, up for the challenge and and confront our demons and make things happen despite all the obstacles that we are facing well let's talk a little bit about um, some of your political views and some of the the political fights you have waded into um, you chose in 2008 to take on a intensely political topic when you founded Jassad, uh, which is a glossary a quarterly magazine dedicated to the body, which is what it means in Arabic. It contained a mixture of reporting about topics such as forced marriage and virginity, and also provided a platform for erotic fiction. Now, unsurprisingly, it proved controversial from the very beginning in Lebanon, and you've, decided, you've described receiving death threats and uh, other uh, threats of violence. Did that very real threat against you as a person impact the way you thought about or practiced your work? Not at all. I can proudly say not at all because, you know, uh, it's I, I've been trained to understand that um, I'm not uh, someone who can blend in in this in this in this culture and in this region. And I've been trained to accept that and to um, even feel proud. Um, about that. So when I started publishing uh, uh, Jassad, I already knew that I was going to, you know, get uh, a lot of threats and attacks and insults. And I didn't allow that to intimidate me. It's part of my, uh, you know, insistence on, on, writing whatever I want to write, saying whatever I want to say, living the way I want to live, and considering all that as my basic fundamental right as a human being, as long as I'm not hurting other people. Why specifically that topic, though, which you know is an I mean, explosively political topic in Lebanon? Because exactly, because because it's we are still scared until now. I mean, that was 2009. That was 15 years ago. Can you imagine that even now I just started a podcast discussing these same topics? It's as if we go one step forward and 10 steps backwards. And it's it's unnerving, it's frustrating. We need to discuss this. We need to liberate our bodies in order to liberate our minds and our souls and our, our, uh, our actions before we 
start uh, feeling convinced that our bodies are ours and ours alone. And here I'm talking obviously about women, but also about men, because men are also slaves of all the taboos that are widespread in, in, in this area. Before we, we do that, we cannot claim to be really free or emancipated or move towards a more enlightened society, which is something we should all be uh, striving for and looking forward to and trying to make it happen. So it's, it's an essential topic. It's obviously something that I've always been interested in. I've always been interested in erotica and the body as much as uh, in, in all the uh, gender violence that I was witnessing around me growing up, all the um, injustices that, uh, that uh, existed and still exist. So I, I, I decided to do the magazine because out of personal interest, but also out of political um, affirmation, because I thought this is something that we need to discuss. I want to see if we can figure out where you sit in the Arab political tradition. Um, you'll recall that we were talking about this just before we came on, that we did a, a literary salon together in Lebanon um, around that time, part of this series of salons I was doing at the time in Beirut and Damascus and elsewhere. Um, but one of the ideas that came up again and again during those salons was this idea of the secular and liberal Arab tradition, which I think you very much embody. Do you feel that that uh, well, first of all, how what would you call it? Would you call it the liberal Arab tradition, the secular Arab tradition? Liberal and secular, just like you said. Okay. And at the time, it felt to me like that was something that was quite common among a uh, a large part of the Arab youth, let's say. And particularly, of course, um, some of the older people who'd been around in the 50s and 60s. Um, I wonder if you think in the 15 years since, things have changed in Lebanon. I mean, do you think that liberal Arab tradition still exists to the degree it used to? Yes, it does exist. But I wouldn't say even then uh, that it was, it constituted a large part of um, Arab uh, societies. Um, I mean, sometimes uh, because we surround ourselves with people who usually think like us, people who belong to the same planet, this is how I call them, uh, who view life the way we view it, who consider freedom a basic right, uh, a basic human right, who uh, think that equality is, is should be obvious and that freedom of expression and freedom of thought and freedom of belief are uh, things that are given and not um, and not things that we should fight for. These people uh, that surround us make us sometimes extrapolate and think that there are many people who are like that in uh, our countries or our our cultures. I have mm -hmm. discovered since that no, that we are a minority and we are still a minority because if you go deep into the country and even if you scratch a little bit. Um, and, and, and some of those um, outwardly liberal, secular people, if you scratch their surface, then the, um, you know, uh, zealot, uh, traditional, conservative, uh, macho monster will come out again. And do, do you think that it's because there isn't, or you, you say there isn't a wide enough group of people who believe that. Do you think that that is why a political tradition didn't reassert itself during the Arab Spring? I do think so. Because when you are uh, forced to choose between uh, uh, a military monster and uh, a religious monster, I mean, there's no, there's, there's no way out from, uh, uh, from the uh, pit where, or the abyss where you are stuck. You are still going to be there. And uh, since there's no viable, I mean, I'm sure there are uh, secular, liberal uh, currents and figures out there in the Arab world, and they are amazing and they're doing great work. But since there's no viable, uh, such viable option, and by viable, I mean 
something that has a big following, that has the means to um, exist and prove itself and lead and govern, then we will still uh, then we will stay stuck between the religious monster and the military monster. And it ha- can have many faces. It can have many masks. But this is how it is. Do you think, though, that the fact that so few Arabs, when they have had the opportunity to agitate for that particular worldview, have not taken the opportunity, do you not think that that is indicative of the fact that not that many people want it? Yeah, I'm sure that not many people want it. And I'm sure that it's it's still not the right time. And it's it breaks my heart. Honestly, it breaks my heart because... When I look in the eyes of those who tried and fought and went, took to the streets and believed in the change, whether uh, in the Arab world, whether in Egypt or Tunisia or wherever, or in Lebanon, I cannot but feel heartbroken because we really believed in that potential uh, different evolved version of our uh, societies, but we are still not ready for that because not enough people want it. Not enough people. Yeah. But don't you think, and this is a hard question to ask, I understand, but don't you think that if not enough people want the liberal Arab tradition, do you not think that is because the liberal Arab tradition has not provided sufficient solutions for the political moment? It it's it's uh, it's one uh, um, it's it's a part of the answer, but it's not all the answer. Let's not also um, uh, neglect or ignore the international interference in all those dynamics. We are not truly those who uh, fully decide what's going to happen to us and what's going to happen in our countries. Were we like that, like, for example, in Lebanon, we would have been able to make it happen. But there are so many. I'm not talking about uh, uh, a conspiracy theory here, Faisal, but there are so many power dynamics and international interests at play that um, at the end of the day, if you manage to move a small rock from its from its place, you've done a lot. It's a miracle because so many things are decided for you. And it's, can you imagine uh, someone who believes uh, in, in, in freedom and who is at the same time aware of how much of this freedom is um, decided by external powers and not by, by your own will? Can you imagine how frustrating that is? But this is the truth. I mean, we cannot we cannot ignore the fact that money runs the world, financial interests run the world, uh, external powers uh, are playing chess in, in in this part of the world, and there's a lot at stake. You haven't shied away from controversial or difficult topics, and. You've, attra- you've attacked and criticized Islam as much as you have Christianity, which is the religion you were born into, although you no longer um, subscribe to any faith, I think. You've previously said that there is a, a form of colonial feminism that I truly despise. Those who consider that in the name of cultural relativism, we need to accept that a woman can wear the niqab or a man should have four wives. I interviewed the French journalist Nabila Ramdani, and she has a rather different view She's described the the French so-called burqa ban as a hateful assault on basic freedoms. So I wonder where you sit along that continuum now. Do you still, uh, do you disagree with that perspective on the burqa? Oh, I disagree with Nabila's view and I stand by even more firmly by uh, what I have written and said on the subject. Uh, I I do believe that, uh, I mean, there's there's no such thing as um, accepting the burqa in the name of uh, respect for uh, people's um, beliefs because the burqa is in itself an imposition and respecting an imposition is not a form of um, 
of, of, of you cannot respect an imposition and say at the same time that you are respecting people's freedom. I know that many women say that they have chosen to wear the burqa, but choice uh, demands many factors. It demands awareness. It demands a proper um, uh, and viable alternative in case you don't want to wear the burqa instead of being persecuted or ostracized or whatever. It demands uh, not being uh, fed and brainwashed ever since you are four or five or six on the fact that you are a mere temptation and you need to cover yourself up in order to uh, not tempt uh, the men around you, which is quite um, insulting to men, honestly. So, yes, I I still believe that um, uh, in the name of cultural relativism, relativism sometimes uh, leftist uh, uh, European and American feminists are um, condoning uh, things that are ab abominable. That would put you very much in the the Arab feminist tradition of people like Nawala Sadawi, who also would have said that you need to stop people wearing this because they cannot truly choose it. But I guess that uh, Ramdani would say that your criticism of the hijab and the niqab is actually antithetical to so much of what you've dedicated your life to, namely giving women the agency to choose what they do with their own bodies. Again, you're using the word choose, and I have a problem with that. I have a big problem with that. Because, I mean, and, and let us let me be clear, as much as I um, consider uh, the burqa um, an imposition and, uh, um, and a form of discrimination and even oppression, the burqa is so oppressive, as much as I consider the porn culture, for example, and uh, the fact that so many women treat their bodies as mere pieces of meat also a result of uh, brainwashing. They might sound different, but it's one and the same, as if the woman only exists as uh, uh, an object, something to look or not look at. And um, it's at this at this level. It's it also uh, uh, reminds me of another analogy because sometimes, for example, people in the West uh, um, make a clear cut between uh, the right wing people who are Islamophobic and those uh, who are um, attached to their uh, not only attached but also zealous in their um, in their beliefs and uh, uh, and and sometimes even extremists i do believe that both extremisms feed each other feed on each other and feed each other and they need each other and we need to find a third way to exist as women, as human beings, without the need to feel like we we uh, uh, we are looked at all the time, so we need to hide or we need to expose. I wonder if part we were talking about the Arab liberal tradition. I wonder if part of the reason why the Arab liberal tradition is falling out of favor, having once been in favor and then uh, fallen out. I wonder if that's partly because of a shift in the idea of what these symbols represent. And I think that's the difference perhaps between you and Ramdani, that for you, you see it as a represent representation of a particular way of seeing the world, um, an oppressive way in your telling. But I think that Ramdani would say that actually we are, you're trying to allow people opportunities to choose whatever it is they prefer whether that is, as we were saying earlier, pornography or, for example, the burqa. And that setup, that way of choosing, is something that is very in keeping with the capitalist creation of the world now. And I wonder if that is the reason why the liberal tradition is kind of moving to the sidelines, because it doesn't have answers for the the, the political moment now. Yeah, and, and, and trust me, once we are truly able to choose whether to uh, walk naked on the street just because we want to or walk in a burqa, 
then I would, um, you know, consider that as uh, something that needs to be totally respected. But still, we are not choosing. And like you said, it's because the liberal Arab tradition hasn't uh, really um, uh, introduced a viable way to, um, let's say, uh, make Islam and, and liberalism compatible. I do believe that's one of the main uh, problems. But also, uh, another problem is that people I'm noticing are becoming more and more religious out of anger and frustration and uh, disappointments. And it's because the governments, I mean, most of the governments are corrupt, are selfish, are self-centered, are um, uh, criminals and robbers and are not truly governing the countries like the countries should be governed. So this is how you find uh, so, uh, uh, a place to run away to. And that place for many people has been Islam. In 2015, you met with the late TV chef Anthony Bourdain uh, on his series Parts Unknown. He asked you if, if he was wrong to love Beirut despite its flaws, uh, to which you replied... I love living on the tip of a volcano, but there has to be some point where I could breathe and relax. Nearly a decade later, you're still here. So can we take it from that that you're committed to your life on the tip of the volcano? Yeah, not only committed, I would say addicted. I don't know if it's a collateral damage of being born here and growing up here and living the life that I have lived. Um, I don't want to praise, um, you know, hardship. It's not that, but I am addicted to this particular volcano. I love my life here, despite all the challenges and the struggles. And I would love to be able to breathe one day from here and think, well, the volcano is giving me um, a small break, and then it will it will wake up again, and that would be fine. But I don't want to breathe abroad. This is where I want to breathe. Jumaan Haddad, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. This has been The Lead, the New Lines magazine podcast. You can find Jumaan on Twitter at jhaddadofficial. Her books have been widely translated and can be found at all good bookstores and online. This week's episode was produced by Finbar Anderson and hosted by me, Faisal Yafai. For more like this, subscribe to The Lead on your favorite podcast app or visit our website, newlinesmag.com. Join us again next week. 